Welcome to Impact OC, the only program showcasing the people and organizations shaping Orange County. With your host, Don Camber. Hello, live from the OC Talk Radio studios. I'm OC Talk Radio Public Affairs Director Don Camber with another great guest impacting our community in a positive way. February is American Heart Month, which focuses on cardiovascular health. Today, on behalf of the American Heart Association, I welcome St. Joseph Heritage Medical Group's only female cardiologist, Dr. Aram Bajwa. Thank you, Dr. Bajwa, for being on Impact OC. Thank you, Don, for having me here today. Dr. Bajwa, please share with us the focus of American Heart Month and National Wear Red Day. So National Wear Red Day is an icon day that the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women movement sort of started. Um, this year, the the Go Red Wear Day is um, actually Friday, February 4th. And we encourage everyone to wear red. It is in honor of those who have, you know, been living with heart disease or stroke. Um, these are the two categories of disease that sort of we represent. And what's the issue with women and not getting themselves checked, which, which necessitated the reason to have American Heart month and wear red day and I, I think the biggest issue that we run into is that women tend to kind of downplay their symptoms or ignore their symptoms because of maybe all the other responsibilities they may have in their life or minimizing their symptoms because a lot of the things out there that they have described about heart attacks or strokes tend to be actually symptoms that men experience so Go Red uh, for women sort of movement became trying to educate the community, trying to educate the women out there that any amount of symptoms could be their symptoms of cardiac issues. Talk about the symptoms and let's talk about the ones that men experience and the ones that women experience. Sure. So uh, men tend to experience the more classic chest pain, central sort of experience of crushing type feeling, an elephant sitting on my chest, that kind of sensation. Uh, symptoms of shortness of breath can be something that women experience that they may not uh, connect as a cardiac symptom, but it is truly a cardiac symptom. So that can be the case. A women can have something as simple as abdominal pain that actually is a representation of their cardiac pain if it is occurring in exertional episodes. So if they are having it every time they're walking, every time they're walking up the stairs or carrying a hamper of laundry, such as those kind of women that are staying home, these are symptoms that they may experience and not have awareness of. I understand heart disease remains the number one killer. Yes, um, despite the era of COVID, we still have a significant number of heart disease that is killing many of Americans today, and it remains the number one killer today in our society. Are they killing more women than men? Um, you know, I think overall the numbers tend to be about the same. There is a small uh, percentage of women that are higher, and I think that is where the Go Red movement came from or the idea of starting the whole um, American Heart Month and focus on this education to the community sort of came from was that women and men both have very high numbers, but women tend to have a little bit higher percentage, and so that's where that came from. Now, I know I understand there's a concern that with COVID, a lot of people aren't getting checked, and therefore they potentially could have heart disease and not know it. That is right. So we are now experiencing more individuals who have been ignoring their symptoms, maybe because of the concern that going to the hospital may expose them to COVID. And a lot of individuals with heart kind of symptoms, whether it's chest pain, palpitations, uh, dizziness, lightheadedness, any of these things, they sort of put their symptoms on the back burner because of the fact that they're concerned they might get exposed to COVID if they go get checked by their cardiologist or go to the hospital with severe symptoms. They really are waiting to the point where they can no longer take the symptom before calling 911. Whereas before, I think there were many people who came to the hospital who we caught heart disease earlier prior to the COVID era and avoided having massive heart attacks at that point. So if a person is experiencing some symptoms or they notice someone experiencing symptoms, what should they do? They need to get help. They need to get to a physician. They need to get to a doctor, whether that is emergently in the ER, whether that's in the urgent care, or whether that's making an appointment with your primary care doctor because your symptoms are not terrible, but they are still happening regularly. So what can they do? How can individuals reclaim their rhythm, which happens to be this year's theme for Heart Month? 
Yeah, so reclaiming your rhythm, we, we have come up with this sort of slogan in the idea that we want you to be able to um, sort of get this message out that we want you to exercise, we want you to eat healthy, we want you to build healthy habits. And even in the era of COVID where people have been staying home, unfortunately, these things have fallen on the back burner simply due to stress that has occurred in the setting of COVID. So from our standpoint, reclaiming your rhythm is this idea that you want to get back on the horse of eating healthy, exercising daily, avoiding stressors, avoiding things like cigarettes and heavy alcohol drinking, things of this nature. That's sort of what we're trying to expose everybody to now. Well, what are the numbers on exercise? How long? So overall, the guidelines of the sort of the American cardiovascular society has been 150 minutes a week is what we recommend. How you break that down, when you do do the breakdown, that's 30 minutes, you know, a day for about five days a week. A lot of people don't really exercise seven days a week, but if you can, go for it. The minimum number we really want you to hit is this 150, which is where we get this cardiovascular change, knowing that you're keeping your heart healthy, you're doing all the right things to keep yourself going from a heart standpoint. What qualifies as exercise? That's a good question. So uh, I think from our standpoint, it's more so getting cardio that we are talking about. There are other terms, types of exercises we want you to put into those 30 minutes. But when we say we want some sort of aerobic exercise where your heart rate is going up, we don't want to just include walking. Walking is great for maintaining uh, your health. However, it is not cardio exercise, so it is not doing a lot for your cardiac system unless you are truly getting your heart rate elevated. So when you say cardio, you want some serious movement occurring. Yes, that is correct. So give us some good examples. Sure. I mean, there are things like yoga, Zumba, uh, hit exercises, things where people can do, um, you know, getting on a treadmill, getting on an elliptical, typical type of stuff. Swimming is a wonderful cardiovascular exercise. It's a little hard to do in the cold. Um, dancing is a wonderful one. Anything that gets you moving and getting your heart rate up, that's what we're looking for. So if a person is walking fast, would they then qualify? So brisk walking, yes. Um, this The typical calculation we do um, for heart rate elevation for people, when we get you to do a treadmill stress test for us, we're looking to do 220 minus your age times 85%. That's your target heart rate when we are working with you on a treadmill for a stress test. We really want somebody to be getting up to that as your maximal heart rate when you're doing some exercise. Well, more than half of American adults have high blood pressure. Advice for them and risks for others. So I think blood pressure, the biggest issue we've been having is that it's a silent issue that people don't know about. And it's one of those very big controllable factors that we want to jump on very early from a cardiovascular prevention standpoint, which is sort of my focus. Uh, so when a patient comes to me and they have had issues with blood pressure, the really big thing we are aware of is that you are already aware that you have blood pressure issues. What about that person who doesn't even know? So if you're getting numbers on your blood pressure checks when you go to the pharmacy or when you end up at your annual physical with your provider, which you know, if we're looking at numbers like over 130, these are times when you're already in stage one hypertension. We want you to get treated to prevent progression of heart disease over time. And that's a very real thing. We don't want in the next 10 years for your elevated blood pressure to cause some sort of damage to the heart. That's something we could have prevented by managing your blood pressure. So my recommendation is to get yourself at least checked once a year, go to your annual physicals, don't ignore those things which are important for continuing preventative health. What about white coat syndrome? Good question. So everyone is anxious coming into doctor's offices or typically even coming to see me. I know that your blood pressure is going to be high. We know that blood pressure can go up and down. The question is, is, is it consistently up when you're doing nothing? So meaning when you're home, are you logging your blood pressure? And it's still as high as it was in our office. That's what I do with my patients who come in with this questionable white coat syndrome. Uh, white coat syndrome is actually also a sign that maybe it's been ignored blood pressure 
and you've just been telling yourself that it's just that I'm anxious when I come to the doctor. So it's actually not being treated. We have ways of doing monitors now for 24-hour blood pressure monitoring that actually give us information about your complete blood pressure for 24 hours. That helps me understand if you truly have high blood pressure even when you're sleeping. That's not white coat. You're not anxious when you're sleeping. So if that's the case, you actually have blood pressure elevation. How does it feel to have high blood pressure? So some people will feel nothing. That's why it's a silent killer. We call it a silent cardiovascular risk that needs to be evaluated by a doctor. Uh, number two, people can feel symptoms when their blood pressure is extremely high, meaning when it's in the ranges of 180, 190, 200 systolic, which is the top number, people can experience headaches, blurry vision, double vision. Um, they can experience chest pain and shortness of breath as well during the time that their blood pressure is elevated, which is different than coronary artery disease, which is blocked artery disease. So high blood pressure can cause cardiovascular disease, I guess, over a period of time? That is correct, yes. And how does that work? Is it over a period of a decade? How does that work? So usually it's a period of about 10 to 15 years that if your blood pressure has been running high without any treatment, yes, unfortunately, it causes so much pressure on the system that it develops more and more weakness of the heart. Can you kind of describe what high blood pressure is in the body? Uh, sure. So high blood pressure is essentially the pressure against which the heart is having to expel blood um, in the body. So the aortic pressure or the large blood vessel that runs in the body has a systolic, which is a pumping pressure and a relaxation pressure called a diastolic pressure. That's really where the, the nomenclature sort of comes from. When that pressure is really high and the heart's having to keep beating against this high pressure, this 180, 190, it puts a lot of strain on the heart. If you can imagine someone lifting heavy weights consistently every single day, every minute of the day, your body gets tired, your muscles get tired. So that's the same concept. You're pushing against that. That's how blood pressure works. How does medication work to alleviate that? So there are different classes of different medications that work in different parts of the body to alleviate that pressure. Some go through the kidneys, some go through the actual vessels itself, some go through the peripheral vasculature. Um, that would be probably getting into a little bit too much right. detail. But I think there are different ways that the blood pressure medications can work to do that. But all in all, the goal is to bring these numbers down as best as possible. So if a person has high blood pressure and they have not been diagnosed and they may have had it for 10 years, it's possible that if they have a heart attack, it could have been caused by undiagnosed high blood pressure. That is correct. Where can people get more information about American Heart? Uh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, going to the website is probably the easiest. Um, American Heart Association has their own website. It's great to just go there for the first place. Um, we have a lot of resources as well through the um, ACC website. This is something that is called the American Cardiovascular um, College of Cardiovascular Disease. So we do a lot of our... Um, I guess guidelines and the information that we use as doctors comes from there. So that's a great website as well to try to use. And do you try to educate young people about it because it's, it's what happens during their younger years as they become adults? Absolutely. I think, um, again, a lot of these patients who go to their annual physicals, which you should even be getting as young adults, is where we pick up a lot of these things. Um, the typical recommendations initially are very simple. It's things like exercise more, eat healthier, and they can educate you about the Mediterranean diet, which is a cardiovascular diet we recommend for our cardiac patients who have had heart attacks. Those are things we recommend to everybody. Um, I think the biggest issue is not recognizing that you need to get evaluated. And when you're young, you have this false pretense that I'm going to live forever and there's nothing wrong with my heart. Well, unfortunately, the amount of stress we carry today is very different than the stressors we had before. Even the stress in the light of COVID is much heavier on our bodies than it was before. So mental health plays a big role in all this. Yes, absolutely. Mental health plays a very direct role. And in fact, it can cause heart disease as well. How? So mental health, there are certain types of cardiovascular disease that come from significant stress, even something called stress cardiomyopathy. Um, when someone goes through a severely, I guess, stressful or traumatic experience, such as a death of a family member, that can actually damage the heart itself. 
Um, we are unfortunately prone to a lot of these things because of the fact that we are very, very emotional beings as human beings. Um, and that does have a very direct connection. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data points about it, but it does have something to do with our hormone regulation. That plays a role in the heart disease when it comes to stress. So to lead a healthy life, what should a person do? Um, you know, I think from my perspective, um, leading a healthy life deals with eating healthy, deals with having a regular exercise regimen, a routine. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are now eating at home because of COVID. They're experiencing more time with their family. And that is actually a stress reliever because you are all together and eating home meals tends to be healthier than eating meals outside at restaurants. Sure, socially, that's a different you know, ball game altogether. However, from a stress management standpoint, these are things we recommend. Meditation on a daily basis. We want you to kind of park your stress elsewhere because we know stress is a natural thing in everybody's life. But you need to be able to step away from it and spend some time sort of taking care of your own body. And that's really the key. Yes, it really is, is trying to make yourself a priority and making a priority of that every day, not just waiting that, oh, when I do this or when I meet this goal, then I will take care of taking care of myself. Do you believe that someday <laughs> women will realize that they should take care of their bodies and we can kind of put an end to heart disease? I do. I think it, it simply has to do with education and getting it out there, getting the information out there. Women are very receptive to, you know, doing the right things that can make them healthier and live longer. I've never had anybody push against me saying, you know, you really should give it more of your effort, give it more of a go. I think that you can do more. Um, most people are very receptive to those kinds of feedbacks. So when people go and they get their their blood pressure check, they yes. should pay attention to it. It's a big deal when that yes, happens. It seems it like is. such a routine thing, but it can be a big deal. Correct. It can be a big deal. And I think paying attention is the biggest issue now is try to be more aware of things. And try to lead a stressless life as much as possible. <laughs> yes, as much as possible, exactly. Can you kind of explain what goes on in the mind when you to identify stress so that you can release your mind of it? Sure. Um, you know, I think when the mind goes through stress, you have difficulty with sleep. Um, you have difficulty with appetite. Um, and these are things that all play a role in the long-term health of our body. Um, when you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you're not exercising, you're sort of just harboring the stress that is happening in the body that's affecting all your organs not just your heart um, and so I think some of the things that to look out for are when you are having symptoms of some sort yes it may be anxiety and it may just be your stress but be certain of that talk to your doctor about it make sure that this is just your stress that's playing into this and not something else that's really what I would say how can people volunteer for the American Heart Association uh, I think there is a volunteering uh, portion of the website where if you just signed up on the website, they would reach out to you. And there are different events that we have. Um, you know, we have like a Go Red Walk. We have community events that you can get involved with. There are hospital events that occur that we can also have volunteers from the community. We would be delighted to have people join us. And when it comes to diet, what is the biggest thing that people do wrong? You know, I think um, portion control has been a big thing that we've also been trying to help with is eating fatty fried foods has always been known to be a problem for the heart. Um, I think most people try to eat or make healthier choices nowadays. Not everybody's into eating the fries and hamburgers and pizza that maybe a few decades ago we were having to just harp everybody about that. A lot of people are eating healthier today. But I think portion control has been a big issue that, you know, if you're eating at a restaurant, you're just eating large portions that you're not thinking about because it's one meal that you've ordered. Um, but I think that being more cognizant and aware of those things, and, and there are many resources on the website that can help you understand what is good for portion control, what is good for, you know, choices on a menu, even if you're eating out or choices of making food in the home. Salt. Salt is a big uh, proponent of issues that happen with the heart. We recommend trying to eat low salt diet. One of my uh, patients actually realized that they weren't eating, uh, they were not even calculating how much salt that they were taking in. And the recommended is about no more than 2,000 milligrams if you're having issues with high blood pressure. Well, he was eating about 10,000 milligrams when he wasn't even checking. And I think that's where most of us fall is we're not checking on the back of packages how much sodium is in any amount of food. 
Well, that's going to directly play into your heart disease risk as time goes on. And it's not so much people adding salt to their food. It's just automatically in the food that they eat. Exactly. It's pre-built in already in the food that they're eating. So they just need to be very careful yeah. with what they're eating. Correct. Now, when it comes to portion control, is there a thing in the mind that should tell you to stop eating? Because I know you go to a restaurant, you're yeah. going to eat everything they give you on the plate. Of course. Um, you know, I think listening to your body about satiety is a very difficult, um, you know, is a difficult concept is trying to tell yourself I'm full, um, which is, you know, satiation or satiety, but then staring at the food and saying, but I could have another bite of dessert or I could have another one of these things. You know, I think that comes with learning the signals of your body and saying, you know what, I am, you know, I am full. I don't need to have more to feel great about myself. Part of that is also emotional eating. Emotional eating plays a big role in some of these issues, which my heart patients definitely, we have, you know, we have to send them to the dietitian. We need help from a team of people to kind of approach what happens once you go through heart disease itself. Well, what are tricks people can do to eat less? You know, I think um, water has been a big proponent that we have always recommended that drinking water um, as, you know, as much as you can really and trying to drink at least 32 to 48 ounces of water um, is really critical to try to get you to know that, hey, I maybe don't need to eat as much food but if I drink a little bit more water, I won't be as feeling like I'm hungry. Um, that is a big trick in a sense that we often recommend is um, fluid and hydration and hydrating your body. Thank you, cardiologist Dr. Aram Bajwa for being on Impact OC. And I thank everyone for tuning in. I'm OC Talk Radio Public Affairs Director Dawn Camber. Have an impactful day. Thank you.